This week, I'm throwing a larger version of the indented bolts I've been making in recent videos. I'll be discussing how I centre larger masses of clay, how I throw wider forms like these, and how I trim them too, once they're leather hard. I'm using soft reclaim for these, and as you can see the lump of clay is full of air pockets, so it'll need a really thorough wedge. I weighed out a lump that was about 6 pounds, which is just over 2.7 kilos, and then, like you've probably seen a hundred times already in my videos, the massive stoneware is wedged up. This was also my second attempt at the bowl. I destroyed the first one when I accidentally stood on the wheel's pedal, causing the piece to go from stationary to full speed in a split second. Which, as you can see, caused the pot to tear itself apart and even cover the heat gun I was using to dry out the overhanging walls. It could have been worse though, at least it was only a pot and all this clay can just be reclaimed and recycled immediately. In college, I saw this very same thing happen, but instead of a pot, it was a bucket of glaze on the wheel. Red glaze spattered everywhere, making the workshop look like a crime scene. This process of spiral wedging pops any voids of air stuck in the clay, which is important as if these air pockets remain, they simply make the throwing process itself more difficult. I'm using quite soft stoneware to make these, as attempting to centre large masses of very firm clay can be tricky, and as ultimately I don't need to get much height out of the walls of this pot, I can get away using softer stuff. The last thing I do is round the bottom of the lump of clay, that way when it's slammed onto the wheel head, it won't trap any air beneath it. Essentially I want to make a large version of this, but with a slight difference in the rim, which I want to leave quite sharp and angular, so that the dark green glaze I use on it breaks in two parts, creating two consecutive circles of orange against the dark green glaze. I'll throw these on a wooden bat, which is attached to a leather hard pad of clay underneath. This way, once the bowl's been thrown, I only have to lift away the wooden platform and carry the bowl with it, rather than just lifting the bowl itself. I slam the lump of clay down, roughly pat it more into the centre, and seal the bottom where it meets the wood. I then cover the clay with plenty of water, and then cone it up as best I can, both hands squeezing inward and travelling up. I then glide my hands back down the mound of clay, pushing inward firmly and trying to keep my hands as steady as possible in order to impart that stillness on the large lump of clay. I'll repeat this process a number of times, and then once the lump feels steady enough, I'll begin to cone it up and down properly. This is a process I do gradually, I still don't make a tremendous amount of large pots, and I'm certainly not as practiced in centering this amount of clay as I am smaller pieces. But I love the challenge, and it feels great after spending a whole day making smaller forms. Once the lump of clay feels like it's running quite smoothly, I'll begin to gradually push it down into the shape needed for the next step, which will be opening up the lump of clay to create the interior portion of the pot. For a bowl like this, which will be quite low and wide and have overhanging walls, I need an initial shape that's quite wide too, as it means the walls won't have to overhang quite so drastically. I brace my forearms on the plastic of the wheel tray and sink my digits right into the centre, my middle fingers leading the way with the aim of creating a sort of V-shaped hollow in the middle of this. I'm also purposefully leaving the bottom to be about an inch thick, which means later on there's enough clay to trim a nice tall footring from. And with the interior form roughed out, I can begin to slowly pull up the walls of the pot. And I'm doing this with a sponge held in my right hand, which is soaked in water as it pushes inward firmly, and follows the hand that's pinching opposite it on the inside. As the mass of clay in between my hands is so thick, I find a soaked sponge helps. As if I were to just use my hands and apply the amount of pressure I am now, the slip of water is quickly lost and the whole form will be dragged off centre. So generally, I only use sponges when throwing larger vessels. With smaller pots, which are thrown more thinly, I really prefer to use my hands and fingertips only, as I feel I have more sensation and I can feel more quickly what's happening on the clay beneath my hands, without a sponge getting in the way. But sometimes, they're really useful. When I make bowl forms, I typically tend to throw the clay upwards, and then once the walls have reached a sufficient height, I gradually bow them outward, letting them overhang bit by bit. If you are throwing like this, it does mean that you need to leave some thickness in the walls of the pot, in the rim especially, as once the clay is stretched outward, if the rim is really thin, the whole pot can literally just tear 
as the fine rim simply can't stand being stretched any thinner. This will be my last pull upward to gain any significant height. From here on after, I'll still throw the walls, but I'll be more concerned about shaping the piece as opposed to making it any taller. I don't curve the form out all at once. Instead, I just do it bit by bit. I start at the base, and at this point, my hand inside the bowl is probably pushing out quite a bit more firmly than that on the outside. My hand on the outside is really just guiding what the one on the inside is doing. It's supporting each movement, making sure that I don't push it out too much, and it also helps to compress the clay as it travels up. Once the rough shape of the bowl has been thrown, I'll begin to add that indentation towards the rim. I push in quite firmly with my outside hand to create a groove, and then I throw that indentation up to the rim, flaring it out slightly as I do. I then use the tip of my thumb and the digits of my left hand to compress the rim into a flat edge, like I spoke about earlier. And with the shape of the vessel practically there, I can move on to refining the piece before taking it off the wheel. This begins by removing as much slip from the pot as I possibly can. This is the slurry that builds up on the surface of the pot. It's the glistening clay you can see that's being removed now with this sharp metal edge. Essentially it's just watered down clay, and you can very well leave it on pots at this stage. But ideally you don't want thick layers of it to remain on your pots overnight, as there is a chance, especially if you're throwing much thinner pots than this, that the slip can soften the clay beneath it and cause the vessel to collapse. Perhaps more importantly though, a skim of slip covering the pot will make it dry out far more slowly. And as potters we already spend so much time waiting for pots to dry, for kilns to cool, and so on, which means any negating of wasted time can be really important. I then scrape away some of the excess clay from around the base, not tons of it, just enough to make a bit of a difference. And I find that making a groove right at the very base of the bowl helps me to guide the wire through when it comes to slicing off the pot from the throwing back. I then remove the last of the slip from the outside form and I just run the edge of a metal kidney over the rim I want to remain squared off. I then take a metal twisted wire and I drag it underneath the vessel, taking care not to knock my knuckles into the underside of the bowl. I then pry the bat off and carry the pot away with it. A few hours later, once the rim is leather hard, I can place a bat on top of the bowl and I'll flip it over. This exposes the base of the bowl, which is usually thicker and a bit wetter than the rim section of the pot, so it'll need a longer time exposed in order to dry out enough to be trimmed. As you can see, the stoneware on the base is still too soft to trim. If you drag your finger over it and it leaves a mark, or if you can easily indent it with just a little bit of pressure, then you shouldn't really be trimming it. It should ideally be more like the rim, which as you can see is taken on a darker red hue and can be poked and prodded without it deforming whatsoever. It's now the following morning and the bowl is ready to turn. I'll begin just by double checking the interior form. So I'll tap center the piece, by whacking it rhythmically in one spot until I see that the rim is running true and there's no undulation in the vessel. This is the form I'm starting with. The top won't change too much, but the bottom certainly will, and hopefully it'll more closely resemble one of these medium versions of the same piece, although I think the indentation I made on the larger bowl is a bit more dramatic, so they won't entirely match. For the inside form, I'll just run a metal kidney over the surface, just to ensure that it's smooth and even. At this point, the bowl is held onto the wheel with three bits of clay that are just squashed against the base. After scraping the interior form, I did reveal some clay that was a bit too soft, so I just blasted the interior form with a heat gun for a minute or two, just to take the edge off. I also quickly trimmed this outward flaring section of the bowl, just to ensure that this part was completely straight and smooth. I brace my right hand, which is trimming, against my left hand, which helps to support it, and the two work in unison so that my movements remain sturdy. Because this rim is relatively high up, 
can't brace my arms on the plastic of the wheel tray in the same way I might with lower pieces, which means I need to find a way to add stability, and that's usually by bracing one hand against the other. And this is perhaps the most annoying thing about trimming the insides of bowl forms. The excess clay that's removed doesn't have anywhere to go other than inside the form, whereas when you're trimming the base of the pot, it can all simply fly off into the wheel tray and accumulate there. I'll also use this moment to scrape smooth the indentation on the outside. And for a process like this, it helps to find a tool which more or less matches the profile of the area you're trimming. And it doesn't need to be perfect. The glaze applied over this area will soften it later on. I then carefully flip the piece over, making sure I place it onto a wheel head that's been scraped clean so no burrs of clay stick themselves into the rim I just carefully finished. The pot is then tap centred again and secured in place with three lumps of soft clay. The bowl's weight and the fact that it's quite a wide form will help to keep it in place, but the lugs are there really just as an extra bit of security as they prevent the bowl from potentially dislodging and spinning into the wheel tray. I then begin to trim the outside curve, and for this as I feel I need to remove quite a lot of material, I'm digging in the corner of the sharp tungsten carbide trimming tool. This way I can remove a lot of clay from one point, and I simply move that point upward, across the form, and to the foot. If instead I try to use the whole expanse of the blade to trim a lot more at once, there's a much greater chance that the pot would dislodge and become off-centre. I then switch to a smaller trimming tool to more or less do the same job, but you can sort of see the two areas I've defined at the bottom. There's the curves of the wall, and then there's the foot ring section. Both of these are trimmed in such a way that they reflect the interior form of the bowl in an attempt to make the walls as even throughout the entire piece as possible. As remember, when I trimmed this, I did purposefully leave some weight in the foot ring and the lower section of the wall, simply to support the overhanging walls, and to provide me with enough clay in order to trim a nice, tall, elegant foot ring from. For forms like this, I'd rather have too much material to work with, as opposed to too little. With the two areas defined, I can begin to shape the foot, which once again is being done in such a way that it hopefully mimics the smaller versions of this bowl, although proportionally it won't be the same. The foot ring itself needs to be a bit wider and made a bit more sturdily too, in order to support what will be heavier walls due to the sheer size of the piece and all the glaze that's then layered over it. If the foot ring was as narrow as those found on my medium sized bowls shown earlier, I'm quite certain the pot would sag as it's fired due to the weight of the piece. Whereas with my medium bowls, which are much lighter, I can get away with really narrow feet and bowls that don't sag, simply because the walls of the vessel itself are incredibly thin and there's barely any weight pressing down. As you just saw, I removed the pot for a moment just to check the thickness of the walls. This is something you should do if you are unsure how much more clay there is in the form to be trimmed off. I'll carefully pick the form up for a moment and using a finger and thumb I'll fill the cross section of the walls and by doing so I can feel the areas which need more turned away. Now comes time to hollow out the footwell, and there's a lot of clay to remove, as ideally you want the depth of the footwell to match the height of the walls found outside the foot ring. If they don't match, and say the interior footwell is higher than the walls outside, it means there's probably excess weight in the pot, and it'll be heavier than needs be. I start this process by defining the rough boundaries of the footwell itself, so I start by making a slight hollow and then I set the outermost boundary with the corner of my turning tool. This way it's easier to contain my trimming, as it can be quite easy when doing this and removing a lot of clay at once, to get sort of carried away, or to have the tool become stuck as it's turning and slip through the outermost portion, which can cause damage that's more or less unrepairable, as it's very easy to remove clay, but adding it back at this stage to say an accidental gouge made on the outside of the foot is really difficult. On a smaller piece perhaps, you can just shove some clay in, dry it quickly, and trim over it. But on a larger piece like this, it can pretty much be make or break. So I trim carefully, removing the clay bit by bit, and holding onto the tool very securely, so it doesn't become caught up in the soft stoneware and dragged, as that's when mistakes happen. As I progress, I periodically gently push the base with a thumb or the tool, and if I feel it giving inward, even just a tiny bit, I know it's time to stop removing clay and trimming downward. Now much like the outside, once the rough shape is there, I can begin to tidy everything up. 
I switch to tools with larger, flatter blades, so more even areas can be turned. I want the foot rim to be as neat as any other part of the pot. Just because it's at the bottom and perhaps won't be seen as often, doesn't mean it should be forgotten. In fact, I'd probably say that I trim these areas more carefully and more neatly than any other part of the pot, as whilst the majority of the walls in the foot ring will be covered with glaze and partly hidden, the topmost portion here will remain as bare clay forever, exposed and protruding through the glass, so it needs to be finished to a high degree. Once I'm happy with the shape, I go over the sharper edges just with the pads of my fingers to soften them. And then like always, the final thing is to stamp in my maker's mark. And then to flatten the slight protrusion it makes as some clay is pushed up. I then take the bowl and flip it and place it onto a clean surface so nothing embeds itself into the freshly turned foot. And then I spend a second just running a kidney over the rim, just to make sure it's smooth and flat. And with that, another pot's finished, and it's now waiting to be glazed and then reduction fired, and I'll do my best to record the rest of that process over the coming weeks. But for now, thanks so much for watching, it really means a lot, and I'll be seeing you again next week with a video that's a little bit different, one that's focused on one particular section of the throwing process.